Manifesto. We want a vibrant, fun and competitive industry. Let's start with an introduction. Um, loyal followers of the iStill blog surely have noticed my growing frustration with the environment in which new craft distillers so often have to operate. The craft distilling industry is mostly a domain that stifles innovation and usually disempowers business operating within it. I think it's time to change that and to see if we can go from a toxic environment to a less toxic environment into an environment that actually empowers you guys and that inspires. I think it's time to flush out what's wrong in order for you guys to be empowered on business opportunity because there's so much to win, right? 0.5% of the big alcohol industry is basically served by us and that's all. We've been at it for 15 or almost 20 years. This manifesto supports to achieve that. And to that end, this manifesto provides a positive example of what we need to aspire to. It analyzes what currently, currently holds the craft distilling industry back. And it lines out how a change for the better can be achieved. It is, in fact, how I see the future of the craft distilling industry. And you're invited along for the way. So if we start with an example to aspire to or something we can draw inspiration from, what I've done in the past is like comparing the craft distilling industry to the craft beer or the craft brewing industry. Uh, and as I've done that in the past, it helped me theorize that the lack of innovation, the lack of empowerment that, that we see in our industry is the result of high entry barriers into our industry. I mean, distilling equipment in general is very expensive and most of it isn't very sophisticated. And, and most importantly, um, the information, the information that you can get on, on, on brewing is so different than the information you can gather around distilling. And most importantly, the information is monopolized and monetized by a distilling industry specific class of self-appointed consultants. The craft beer scene is a much better place to be at. It's competitive, it takes the battle to big alcohol, it has 8% market share where we are at 0.5 and it's actually fun to be a craft brewer. So if you want to follow their example and create an industry as vibrant as theirs, what do we need to do? Well first let's analyze what makes our industries different and secondly let's execute change so that we can catch up with the brewers. So what does craft distilling as an industry do differently? Well, where craft brewers base their profession on huge amounts of hobby, amateurs and professional brewers actually talking to each other and sharing their ideas, learning from each other, vice versa. Craft distillers are not so lucky. You need a consultant in order to be able to develop a recipe and that consultant willingly and unbiased, but not really, but more on that later, gives you his or her opinion on what you need and what you need to do. The craft brewing industry heavily relies on science. Beer making is not about the romance. Beer making is about the facts. Get your facts right and you'll get the beer right. Brewers discuss those facts intensely on open forums with each other. And as most of them understand the fundamentals to brewing, they're all able to judge other craft beers. And not in terms of, hey, I like this or I don't really like this beer, but really in terms of what procedures are applied. Is the taste profile correct for the beer that I'm actually ordering and drinking here? And maybe even a discussion on what should be done different in order to optimize the recipe that you ordered and are judging and drinking at this very moment. Craft distilling industry does not enjoy such advantages. Consultants convince you that it's all about the romance and preferably with a bit of their magic added to that romance. Magic instead of facts and magic instead of science. But if you listen to the consultant, all will be fine. The problem is that those consultants that you somehow need to hire if you want to enter our industry, 
they're neither distillers nor scientists. They have preferences, but not facts. They like some spirits better than others, but cannot really explain why. They are opinionated, that's sure, but not objective. You can hire them to win medals because they are the medal judges. They are the guys that decide who is going to win the awards. Not because they have any scientific fact or a proven methodology to improve your spirits, simply because they are in that position of power. In the craft brewing industry, the brewers and or the beer drinkers rate the beers. Now, how's that for democracy? How's that for empowerment? Imagine the feedback you get from your customers and that you allow yourself to improve your beers or maybe your spirits based on that feedback. In our industry, it's the judges that hand out the medals. The judges that also work as the so-called consultants and that you have to hire if you want to win medals as well. The reason the craft brewing industry hardly has any consultants is because of the free flow of information and the high quality of that information. The lack of high quality and free flowing information in our industry is the reason why for too large a part the narrative is controlled by those consultants. So one might ask, right, so how do they manage to obtain such a position of power, such a position of influence, and why do they defend that position so vigorously? Well, I think we need to explore that a little bit to get to the bottom of it all. First, distillers themselves come to the industry relatively unprepared, much less prepared than brewers do. They do not have the experience usually of making a lot of different beer recipes or drinks recipes. They haven't been trained in the scientific facts, are unable to objectively test and rate other spirits. That lack of knowledge and experience has quickly been filled about 15 years ago by spirits judges and other self-appointed industry experts. But these experts and these judges were only better than you at one thing, and that's selling their services. Not at making great product themselves, because if they would have made great spirits, we'd know them as the craft distillers we actually look up to, instead of the metal movers that they actually are. Secondly, why do those consultants not embrace, let's say, the ever-growing ISTL community? The associated free flow of information that we've been providing, the scientific studies that we've released, the models that we've given to craft distillers, why didn't they jump on board? The answer is pretty evident. The information monopoly that they've created serves them well. So a bit more on the information monopoly. Marginalizing other available information is what keeps your monopoly in place. So don't listen to the amateurs, don't listen to your colleagues because that colleague didn't consult with me, so what do you expect? Can it be any good? It is the monopoly that makes the consultants a lot of money. Don't listen to the amateurs, listen to us, listen to the professionals, they say, because that's how they see themselves. But they don't have any procedures, they don't have any scientific background. And it's not just the consultants, right? It's more than that. It's also the traditional manufacturer of distilling equipment. As long as they hire the consultants to consult with their customers, these customers tend to win awards, even with mediocre product at best. And then there's a third group that's involved here, a third group that benefits and strengthens the information monopoly that strangles our industry at the moment. And that's basically conventions and expos like ADI and the former London Craft Distilling Exposition. And together they form a, an unholy trinity where the consultants facilitate the expos by providing them with topics, visitors, things they need to learn about on those expos. The expos in return facilitate the consultants by offering them a place to sell their services. And the traditional manufacturers basically facilitate the consultants by providing them with customers who in turn get trained by them on their retarded stills. Consultants in return advise new distillers to choose for those traditional still builders because they're the ones that bring them money, right? They're the ones that provide those consultants with most of their customers. Copper still manufacturers, the traditional ones, facilitate the expos by sponsoring them. Expos and consultants that organize them in return facilitate those traditional manufacturers 
with preferential treatment in exposure as well as in awards. Consultants, expos and the traditional steel manufacturers all cooperate to keep this information monopoly in place because with this monopoly in place you, as a starting craft distiller, have no other choice but to work with them and basically to work through them. If you want to gain access to the information you think you need or they tell you that you need and if you want to win medals because that's the promise they sell to you. Now this practice this is what puts a neck choke around our industry. It is what stifles innovation. It is what disempowers the craft distilling industry from developing into the vibrant and innovative marketplace it should be and it could be. Just like craft beer shows us each and every time they take more market share away from big beer. Where we as an industry simply do not seem to be able to do that. A bit more on iStills efforts to, to change the industry, right? We've been around for almost a decade, so is it all that bad? Well, it, it actually was pretty bad when I entered it like 10 years ago because there was only one narrative and only one story and that's it. And then we started iStill and we started to hit the market a decade ago and things did start to change, right? We brought advanced technologies to the market, scientific knowledge to the industry and I, I remember how amazing it felt to bring a suite of innovations that brought to, to an entire industry, even though it's not the biggest industry in the world. Our goal was, and our goal still is, to make distilling easier. Technological innovations were followed with an amazing educational facility, the Eistel University. And when we had the education properly set up, we created an outstanding recipe development department. Everything was aimed at empowering the craft distilling industry, at empowering you through a set of broad innovations. So what's the applause we got, right, for these investments and for all the sharing and all the research that we did? Well, silence, disdain, and more treatment, right? Now that's weird, right, because usually it's those kind of things that sort of propel an industry forward, but not in our case, not in our industry. In any healthy industry, topics like innovation, education, higher quality spirits and products would have been welcomed and would have flourished as they would have propelled that industry forward. In the craft distilling industry, that has not been the case. We have been met with suspicion, we have been maltreated, we have been threatened even. Mind you, not by you, not by the craft distillers. Our customers are an amazing interesting and loyal and successful bunch and, and the best we could wish for. Nope. You can guess it, right? We have been maltreated, we've been met with suspicion, we've been even threatened by those members of what I now call the unholy trinity, by consultants basically, by expos even, and especially by the guys that try to sell equipment to you that is basically pretty outdated and now here we are, traditional steel suppliers. Resistance that we faced and the results that we achieved, I think that's, that's worth thinking a bit about or at least talking about a little bit because well, for over a decade we've tried to change it, being part of the industry the way it looks, trying to be a bit of a mainstream company almost. But about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, started to realize that this strategy wasn't really working perfectly. Simply because the model that I propose was in a very real way a direct threat to the existing consultants, their expos and their associated traditional steel manufacturers. I mean imagine whenever we educate a new distiller, the iSteel University, he or she is forever lost to consultants simply because that student of ours at the iSteel University now knows more about the theory of distillation, the science of distilling than any of the consultants. Does he need more information? Great, he's part of a network of professionals. People help each other out, makers, not fakers. And that's how you get more support. Another example, whenever we sell an ice still, that's a still that's not going to go to a traditional still manufacturer who is not going to put a consultant on that project to help train that person on this very difficult to run outdated still. Well, uh, 
we sold 1,100 of them already in the last decade. So that's 1,100 stills that don't go to the copper boys. Then again, our units are automated. We get, we get you guys trained, right? They're easy and intuitive to run. So again, there's no reason to hire a consultant. Another example, whenever we teach a distiller how to develop his own recipes, and that's what we do here, he no longer needs a self-appointed consultant. Also, since he learned how to make the recipe on an ice still, the chance of him purchasing a bigger production size ice still is probably 99%, again, limiting the market access or the sales potential of traditional still manufacturers. So with every still that we sell, with every student that we educate and with each and every recipe that we help develop, we eat away at the money this unholy trinity can make. We and our customers together, we are the antidote to the fear and uncertainty and doubt that they try to spread. We are the antidote to consultants, in a way they're expos, and definitely the outdated still suppliers that they work together with, that combine try to keep us, try to keep the industry basically in a state of dark ages, right? So with over 1,100 students educated, we took 1,100 projects away from consultants. With over 1,100 I still sold in a decade, that's over 1,100 traditional stills not being sold. Prices of traditional 500 liter still set up have tanked over the last decade due to our competition. 10 years ago, you could buy a 500 liter setup, traditional setup, for 250 grand. Today, you probably pay 110 to 120K. Now, let us serve as proof of our success in changing the industry, at least for a part. That's a cause why so many hate us, right? And especially, especially if you now have to sell antiquated equipment for basically less than half the price you used to sell it at. So great results, right? So what's wrong? What's wrong is that still 60 to 65% of new still sales are of the traditional type. What's wrong is that still half of the new entries into our market, into our, market, into our industry feel they need to hire a consultant. So as stated above, things have moved and even progressed with our inside out approach and strategy. But not enough. The consultants, the traditional manufacturers, and their expos are still mainstream. Let's change that. So you might wonder, right, why do we need to change? Because Odin is always talking about changing things. Well, asks a lot of energy, right, to change things. So why should we? Well, we can't change them from within. Something's got to give because look at the, the example of, of craft beer. Over 8% market share taken away from big beer. And we're at 0.5%, so we're not doing very well. We need to remove the information monopoly. We need to probably remove those that keep it in place. Because if we don't, those that use the status quo will simply suck you dry of your money and potentially a successful future. And if you still feel that, well, change, you know, that's, that's a lot of work, maybe it's not needed. If you still think our industry is in pretty good or at least decent shape, allow me, allow me to propose a, a thought experiment. And I'll perform this just based on five questions. I can come up with 20 more in a minute, but let's just take five questions and see how the answers feel. See how the questions feel. See if they make sense if you think we do not need to change. In which industry is it mainstream? to work with technology that's over a century and a half old. Two, in this day and age, which industry ignores a technology that saves 70% of energy expenditure? Three, what industry does not wish to save on staffing? Four, what industry believes that variability of outcome of goods produced is actually something good? And fifth, what industry outsources product development to people who never manufactured a drop in their lives? Five questions. Well, as 60 to 65% of new craft distillers is still being convinced by these so-called consultants that they need to invest and work with distillation technology from the 19th century and before, the answer to the first question must be the craft distilling industry. And it is. 
Do you know any other industry that has resisted new technology so much? Imagine, are we still baking bread on a wood-fired oven? Do we do transport on horses and carriage? As a distiller, we have a lot of administrative affairs that we need to take care of. How do we do those? With, with sharpened feathers, ink and paper? Or do we simply use software? Of course, the latter. The environment is an issue. Energy costs matter. Read the news. I mean, try to imagine an industry where the environment and energy input costs are, are not an issue. You won't come up with one. I mean, even Formula One Motorsports has its own agenda uh, to help reach certain environmental goals and tries to make the sport energy neutral. Craft distilling? Oh no, for God's sake, let's convince new entries that they need to choose for a sloppy, outdated, energy-consuming technology. I mean, how many consultants have you seen supporting our alternative technology? Technology that saves 70 to 75 percent on energy. None? Only in the craft distilling industry. And really, you hire a consultant, the question comes up, like what equipment should I buy? Can you name one consultant that said, I still, or at least said like, hey, yeah, well, there's two thoughts. You can go traditional or you can go for something that's really efficient. And I'm not sure which is the best decision because it's your company and it's your money. No consultant ever says that. You now start to understand why. We don't deliver customers to them. In a time where it becomes more difficult by the day to find qualified staff, why not automate? Well, not in the craft distilling industry. Let's start our business with a hiring spree. It's the worst business consultancy you can give. Let's start by getting the costs up as much as we can. Or let's put the guy that owns it and that's passionate about his craft distillery behind the still instead of in marketing and sales where you make money. Only in the craft distilling industry. It's a bit like Henry Ford II, the son of Henry Ford, going to the factory and saying like, oh, well, we don't need all that automation. Let's go back to the old days, right? Where we were doing coach building one at a time. You decide, we build it, project status, anything. Oh, whoa, wait, is there a new technology that saves one to one and a half FTE on staffing per distillation machine? Again, only in the craft distilling industry do new entries get convinced by people who haven't produced a drop in their lives that they should look the other way. Okay, point number four, and this is maybe my favorite one, variability of spirits produced. I mean, I speak to craft distillers and, and some of them that are in business and use, well, the outdated kind of stills, they say that it's actually an inevitable part of their craft distillery, that the outcome fluctuates. And then they say something weird like, hey, it's craft, right? So it's different every time. And I'm like, no, it isn't. And the craft brewer is like, no, it isn't, because craft brewers can actually replicate their beer recipes. In fact, among brewers, recipe reproduction is a sign of quality, and rightfully so. But not in the craft distilling industry, at least not among those that listen to the old boys network. Consultants, expos, copper still manufacturers. Good riddance, they must have thought by the time that we entered the market. Good riddance, our consultancy and our outdated technology for sure is not going to be able to make high quality product in a reproducible manner. How do we convince new market entries to choose for us? Well, let me think. Uh, I need to come up with something good here, right? Yeah, I think I've got it. Let's call it craft instead of crap. That's how they sell it to you. But crap is crap and not craft. To understand the idiocy of this claim that outcome, variability and outcome is something good, that you need equipment that isn't able to reproduce anything, well, take a look at your new car. You just bought a new car, you spend a lot of money, and you look at the panel gaps and they are, they're off. They're big, they're not consistent. Congratulations, go back to the car dealership and then congratulate him on, on delivering such a nice and crafted car. Really good, right? Because variability of outcome is something good, apparently. No, it isn't. I mean, it is according to some of the leaders in our industry, but you know very well you won't be happy with that car and those panel gaps and you're going to say something completely different to your car dealership. Fix it. Another example, a bit closer to home. Take your best friend to that craft brewery. You know the one where you enjoy that imperial style that you loved so much? Now take him there, order two, 
one for him and one for you. And if you don't recognize it this second, second time around, if you actually don't even really like it, stand up and congratulate the brewer on his, on his success because there's variability of outcome, which must mean that it's craft instead of crap, right? He must be a master brewer instead of a messy brewer. And if we are to believe the distilling consultant's lingo, he's a true craft brewer instead of a crappy one. Again, really? We all know it's not the case, so don't let this story be sold to you. Success is not handed, it is gained. And those that are not makers are probably fakers. These are the wise words of a fellow craft distiller. If you want to learn how to make the best, let's say wedding cakes as an example, you need to teach yourself how to bake wedding cakes. And yeah, you could hire an expert or you could take classes at an export, expert, with an expert, right? But with whom? With an established wedding cake baker or with a consultant that never ever baked an actual cake? But hey, the rumor has it that part of a secret recipe is hidden in his pocket somewhere and you might get your hands on it. For sure, you're going to hire the baker. For sure, you will enlist for a course with the woman or man that already does it. You want to be trained by someone who already is successfully producing and selling those wedding cakes instead of being fooled by an idiot with an idea of how to make himself money at your expense and without any actual experience to contribute to you becoming a craft distiller. Not in our industry. In the craft distilling industry, we're all fooled, well, let's say 65% of the people are all fooled into believing there's some kind of magic brotherhood out there, spirits whisperers just waiting to help you out. Well, here's an eye opener. If they never had a successful distillery, they are probably not makers and very probably fakers. Leeches that are after your money. The only growth that they support is the one on their bank account at the expense of yours. Now imagine, I still trying to change that from the inside out like, we, like we've been doing, right? Uh, why were we only partially successful? Well, remember how I described consultants, expos and traditional manufacturers all facilitating each other? Again, see us operating in that field. It's easy to conclude why we never fully could yet achieve our goals. One, we don't facilitate consultants with customers. So they don't advise our customers or new craft distillers to actually buy our stills. Two, we are not allowed to facilitate expos. I've reached out to many of them in the past and said like, hey, we've got an amazing amount of, of information and science here. No, 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 you're not allowed to share that on the expos because that would hurt the self-promoting activities of the consultants that help organize those shows. Number three, we are outside an unfair competition for all traditional steel manufacturers because we tank all of their business models. And finally, number four, we actively fight the monopoly on information via videos like this, the iSteel blog and the iSteel University. We try to get all the information out there, scientific information, science fact not science opinion, so that you can make better decisions. So a long story, a little bit shorter, a manifesto to permanently change our industry for the better. If you start to see like us that it's difficult to win this from the outside, from the inside out, we need to do it from the outside in, right? We've been preparing for that for some time. Create a new industry structure. And if it's better, and that's, that's your decision, right? Because it's much more your industry than it is my or our industry. If it's better, you want to promote it, you want to be part of it, and it will win. But it needs to be outside in, because monopolies simply are never changed from the inside out. So outside in, how does that look like? How do we do that? How do we create a thriving environment for craft distillers to flourish? What is needed to provide a craft in the distilling industry with an alternative universe? An environment where innovation serves to empower you and your colleagues. 
In a way, these are very difficult questions, but the answers are actually pretty easy to find. I mean, the current model, the one that we've been trying to change from the inside out, offers all the answers. If our industry can be stifled by a monopoly of information, which is held in place by self-proclaimed consultants, their expos, and the steel manufacturers that pay for them, don't we simply need to do the exact opposite? Isn't it the exact mirror of what we see as mainstream right now that we need to achieve in order to create that alternative environment that our industry so much deserves? Four points. So what is needed is a new technology that is affordable, more efficient, less hands-on and that produces better quality spirits in a reproducible manner. Number two, a new type of consultancy that's provided by peers, by your colleagues the guys, the people that you look up to, by makers instead of fakers. Third thing that is needed is symposiums by craft distillers for craft distillers. And the final point, free access to all information, experimental as well as scientifically proven, so that it's the craft distillers that can make the shots and make the right decisions, instead of them having to depend on self-proclaimed consultants. Well, where are we? New technology. Check. We're here. Eistel is here. We've changed everything. It ticks all the boxes. Pretty self-serving, right? But it's there. And yeah, we can go back to making traditional copper stills. Seems to be a good business model. I mean, with our competition out of the way, we can go back to 250k for a still and keep on charging you every year because, hey, they rust away. But we're here and that's a relief, right? Because it means there's an alternative. Second thing, Eistel University Facebook group has over the last few years experimented and, and successfully so with peer-to-peer -peer review and peer-to-peer -peer consultancy. Not a paid service, the still is helping each other out under the premise that, hey, if you have got a question, somebody will help me out. Does it work? It works like a charm and it can serve as a blueprint for how our entire industry could collaborate and make well, service of consultants and their semi-magical impact redundant. A network that helps boost our quality to the extent that we really can take the battle to big alcohol. Just like craft brewers are already doing for over two decades. We don't need expos that serve consultants. What the industry needs are symposiums by distillers and for distillers. The symposium should address the future of the industry and should provide practical information that makes entering the industry easier. A brighter future combined with low entry barriers. Symposiums shouldn't have sponsors, shouldn't be for profit, shouldn't have exhibitors, and it definitely shouldn't be organized by consultants. Most importantly, it's the current monopoly on information that needs to be addressed. Let's open up all information so that the biggest entry barrier to our industry that, that we have is basically brought down. Let us create that level playing field where distillers can be in charge of their futures because they have access to all the information they need instead of them being dependent on those consultants that only look after themselves and that try to take advantage all too often of you, prey on you and on your insecurities. So to wrap things up, what does that mean coming from me as the founder and CEO of iStill? Well, we've made some decisions. The iStill management team has made some decisions to help realize or promote that alternative environment that we foresee is needed. Three decisions. One, make all factual distilling information available online and free to help end the current monopoly of information. So that's my promise to you, we'll do that. Second, allow all distillers that assimilate this information previously provided to become part of our peer-to-peer -peer network so that we can together empower the industry. Thirdly, we're going to help and only help organize the first Future of Craft Symposium by distillers and for distillers, somewhere in Q3 or Q4 2023. Now, we expect that with our science-based knowledge freely available, nobody needs to consult it anymore. It's there, it's going to be online. We believe that if you feel you still need answers and support, and in a way we all do, especially when we're starting out, it is best given by your colleagues. 
as they have already walked the path in front of you. And we think that a Future of Craft Symposium benefits the individual craft distiller and the industry as a whole, as long as it's the craft distillers, both visitors and contributors, that call the shots. And that's basically what I had to say. And the only thing I'd like to add to that is, look at my manifesto again, see if you agree with it. I can guarantee you, and this is further proof of how fucked up our industry is, that even though I wrote it, and I'm pretty much the biggest innovator in this industry, and the biggest supplier of distilling equipment, and I've helped build together with my team the biggest um, educational network, and also we do most recipe development for craft distillers. So you might say like, oh wow, Odin says something that makes sense, it needs to be published. I can guarantee you none of the papers, they're all run by consultants, are going to publish what I just said. So if you agree with it, in a way it means that the ball is in your park. Responsibility also rests on your shoulder. If it is important to make this happen, we need to make it happen together. So rally behind it. Make sure that everybody reads it. If you get somebody visiting your distillery who wants to open a distillery, make sure that this is the information he gets. Because if he doesn't, we'll keep supporting the system as is. And that basically is what prevents us from becoming successful. I don't want that. Thank you.